My name is Nathan, also known as Kinda Drake Online. I'd say growing up was very much towards when the internet formed childhoods. Like, it wasn't there since I was, like, a baby, so I wasn't, like, an iPad kid. But, like, definitely towards, like, eight years of age, maybe a little bit younger, we definitely had, like, a personal computer. And, uh, I mean... You, you can ask anyone my age or a little bit younger. And even, like, some kids in the next generation, or previous generation, I, I should say. Like, when they were teens, they were playing the older games. Like, the way technolo technology technology was, was formatted was revolutionary, and to a degree still is, um, to the point where, you know, arguably, we still have some things we need to work the kinks out of. But, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no... I'm no professional at that so when it comes to like how I was formed I mean like when I think of, of childhood or, or like how I was formed as a human being I mean watching Minecraft YouTubers I feel like I feel like that's like a lot of people my age and my demographic yeah I like I, I didn't socialize well even before getting attracted to the internet there's probably some ADHD bullshit uh, that's undiagnosed, but I don't really give a shit enough to to get diagnosed because that just um you know it's it's not another thing I need to be to be like oh I have ADHD it's like whether I do or don't have it you know doesn't really affect the way I live yeah I, I couldn't really socialize with other kids super well I didn't I couldn't hang out with many kids in my neighborhood because they were all older than me um. Other than like school, I was I was fairly isolated, and uh, even inside school, I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, <laughs> but when it came to the internet, I just consumed so much fucking YouTube. I remember playing a little bit of Wizard One Hundred One, but my, <laughs> our processor on our like old PC couldn't handle it, so it was literally running at like two frames a second, and then I think it froze in the in the tutorial. Which was bonkers to me. But yeah, Minecraft. I even like towards thirteen years of age, uh, started making content, uh, like like gaming videos. Um, a lot of Pokemon, a lot of Nintendo actually. Uh, but Pokemon was was you know very large in part. Um, I'm trying to think of like what it, Skylanders, Bakugan. Go goes crazy bones, um, which is how I met George, and we'll we'll get into that. Uh, but definitely like a <laughs> very much a consumer of of these products, especially fucking Skylanders. Um, I spent over a thousand dollars on like series one to series three, having the complete collection. And when I was trying to buy my own PC, I was so desperate for money that I sold them all to GameStop for forty four dollars, which is if you do the math. Less than 0.5% of the actual retail value. Which in hindsight is incredibly stupid of me. Because the PC I was getting was also probably around $1,000. So like $44 in the grand scheme of scenes is, is fucking piss in the pan. <laughs> T towards teenage years, I was definitely a consumer of, of Filthy Frank, uh, Max Mofo, iDubs, The Trio. Um, I think there was a little bit of 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 uh, leafy here at some point. Um, I picked up League of Legends, which is a fucking horrible decision, but you know, it's a game, and I played it, and I was shit at it. Still, I am. I think Overwatch Two at some point. Not uh, Overwatch Two. Overwatch T O O, like the first one. Fuck, that's right. I had a I had a, I had a Wii growing up. Eventually got my own DS. I think the first game I ever played and owned was Pokemon Platinum. I'm trying to if I can think what else. 3DS was big too when I, when I got that. I actually broke the circle pad on my 3DS playing Smash Brothers in the in the lunchroom in high school. I was shit at that too. I'm shit at a lot of things, but um, maybe I'm not, and I'm just being too hard on myself. But who, who gives a shit? 
I originally was a fan of George back when he did stop motions under the name Cooler Now One Two Three with the Go Go's Crazy Bones revival of the 2010s, um, or earlier. I don't remember, but um, there there was a website, and he was one of the people that was in a way like front paged um, by Go Go's Crazy Bones, the website. And uh, I would watch all the fucking stop motions. And eventually, I think I found his his YouTube and uh, was subscribed. And he had a forum. Uh, if anybody fucking remembers the the Cooler Now 123, I think it was a Weebly forum? No. It, was, it starts with a W. Like Word, Word Stop, WordPress, one of those fucking blog sites. I was fucking on there. And uh, I think one of the GoGo's ideas, I think it's... Time for pie or dying for it was dying for pie because he took like ideas from people um in the in the blogs uh and that was my idea and I don't fucking know why but in between cooler now one two three and robot underscore I asked I, I fucking forget how I got a hold of him it might have been through that same blog post uh website but I was just like hey. Can I do like a sort of interview thing? And I I <laughs> I distinctly remember how I recorded it. I had like a fucking not energy drink can, but like you know those cans that are like taller than normal soda cans. I had them, I had them on my phone, I think, or iPod. Yeah, it was my iPod, and I played it into my mic because I only had one mic, and I don't think I learned how to like record both his audio and my audio and like OBS. Cause I was absolutely stupid as a child. Um, and he actually accepted my interview and I got a hold of his Skype because of that. And I want to say promptly after the interview, he invited me to a group chat with, with two other guys, shout out Matt and Josh. And we, we fucked around on there. We, uh, we were all just prepubescent kids saying and doing stupid shit i'll tell you that if you ever find chat logs of whatever shit we say uh i want to say from the get-go i'm sorry <laughs> not i don't exactly remember what i say or what i said or what they said but i know it probably wasn't good so god forbid that ever gets out i don't think i said anything like heinous but uh it, def it definitely wasn't the most intelligent of, of conversation through that whole process um george eventually made the robot underscore channel where he revamped to be a 3d channel of, of sorts. And that was the first time I worked with him as a voice actor for I believe it's fist. I'm actually, I'm going to pause quick and double check while looking up, uh, what voice I did. I actually remember I did even before that I, I was Reginald from rich dinos and, and Mitchell. Uh, and fucking hear my voice back then is cringy as shit, but I mean, that's, that's looking back at most things, but yeah, I was, I was in Giru, probably one of my least favorite Go-Go's, but everyone, uh, in our friend group loves the shit out of him. And I will get into arguments with, with, uh, with George and, and Chris Comvic over, over it. <laughs> uh, and you know, that was a surreal experience. I eventually got to work with his friend, uh, Ethan who is arguably right now a successful animator himself. Then I was also Bird and Turtle and Bird for him. Um, and we just kept doing more and more, more things together. But I think from the get-go, we were just friends. At some point through all of that, we went to IndieCade in Queens, New York at the Museum of Moving Image, I want to say. It's where the uh, He Will Not Divide Us Shia LaBeouf was, if, if, if anybody fucking remembers that. Um, and I, I met him, I met his sister, I met Ethan, and we, we had a blast. And it was just nice to, to know he wasn't a predator, you know? I, I feel like that's pretty reassuring uh, for, for not just me, but also my parents. <laughs> uh, and then we also met up with, with Matt and Josh that day, too. Uh, so, so that was just overall great. And over time, we became bigger friends. Um, we grew pretty close. He's one of my closest online friends to date. Um, he's visited my place a shit ton of times. I don't think I visited his, his visited him once because uh, I don't I don't feel like driving in New York. 
<laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, but driving in New York, especially where he lives or lived, uh, is is not desirable. But I mean, through all the roles I did, even with idiots, uh, uh, pff, not idiots.exe. Well, I mean, yeah, idiots.exe, and also Stickman twenty twenty, and um, also the very shortly lived uh, Teddy and Ben. I was just happy that I could, you know, work with my friend and and uh, him positively thinking me as a as a voice actor, like a good one. <laughs> Even if like I could debate on like the definition of good, <laughs> but I'm I'm very grateful of the of the friendship we had and the experiences we've had together, uh, good and bad. I do think he formatted me uh, as a person in a in a very good way. I don't know who I would be without him because he's a very big part of my life. When I personally started voice acting, I watched a uh, Mick Lauer or Rice Pirates very small guide on YouTube called Lip Smack, and that just gave me a very rough baseline of of where to start. Um I personally don't recommend watching him anymore because <laughs> of because of uh recent um <laughs> discoveries. At the same time, I feel like if you want to get into voice acting, the entry gate is very low. It's very low. Anybody can buy a mic, shitty or good. You could be the worst voice actor and buy the highest quality mic, genuinely. Uh, so it is, in a way, sort of like Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> Where, like, you could be the best player in the world, but if you don't have the money to buy the right cards, you know, you're not going to win games. So the same way, you could be the best voice actor ever, but if you don't have at least subpar equipment, um, you know, people are going to be nitpicky and not wanting to choose you, depending on like what quality of, of, of product they're going for. Um, I personally don't have a recording booth. Whenever I need to record something, quote unquote, professional, I go into my closet and that has never failed me. I've never gotten any complaints from recording in my closet, uh, except for my parents, because our walls are fucking paper thin. Mental advice, I think I already went before, but I mean, do it for fun at first. You know, do it because you want to. If you want to do it to get into a game or get into anime, you know, I, I, I do think you know, that's a cool idea. But I mean, there, there's, there's other parts of, of being a VA. I mean, especially the climate is so much different from like when it was like in the 90s because of the Internet and people creating. Like you have all these amazing animators and artists on new grounds um as well as youtube um and then you know depending on who you ask about steam you know letting almost anything in on their platform including nazi furry one and nazi furry two that's right there's two there might be a third i, I haven't checked <laughs> it's personally not in my interest to check but it is a <laughs> despite what some professional vas would say it is a very open field to get into and you could do training uh you could do uh, uh a ton of things i personally am self-taught uh on almost everything um i've never taken a class not that i'm against it but i'm just like we've got google <laughs> i don't know if i want to pay 200 dollars to talk to this voice actor when i could just google the questions that i really want answered it's also okay to like if you don't feel in the mood to to voice act, you know. I think that goes with a lot of creative processes, like with with artists and drawing. Because my partner's my partner's my partner is an artist, and it's just like if there's no creative stuff flowing, you know, you can't force that shit out of you. Like if you can't think of lyrics to write for a song, you know, forcing that shit out, even if the song sounds good, is not going to make a good product. If you're if you're forcing work out when there's when there's no emotion behind it when there's I mean <laughs> not that like my my gr my work is groundbreaking because there was so much passion behind my voice as a bird <laughs> Miller no but I mean it's motivation is a very big part of of creating like actually being creative. Uh, cause, cause it is a facet of, of human ingenuity and, and some assets of, of nature itself as well. In terms of maybe like expanding your arsenal of voices or tones or getting better at what you do, just practice, just talk a whole lot. 
just talk just keep talking in like different voices you want to do um or different tones you'd like to do um an example is uh screaming and metal if you want to get better with screaming you don't just do it you, there's there's a certain way you got to do it otherwise you're going to fry your throat in like two years and you'll never be able to scream again because you didn't take proper care of your throat um and I don't think it's that extreme with, with the voice acting, but it does come with a lot of practice, and especially if you don't keep that, that your, your skills honed, you can definitely lose them over time or it's harder to get to that point. As I've realized in the booth after having like a dry spell of, of not doing any projects and trying to do a voice I thought I had down and then me spending like 20 minutes trying to get the voice down uh, before I get like an actually presentable take. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, cause we're all human. We make mistakes. Shit happens. I, I don't, I personally don't think I'm, I'm on the forefront of knowledge for when it comes to quintessential elements that form good or bad media. Uh, but I've definitely played my fair share of, of bad games and watched my fair share of, of bad shows, bad movies, bad animes. The first thing that comes to mind is, is like a cultic nine. I think it was the sub. And it, and it sucked ass because the story for me didn't make sense. And it also didn't make sense for a person who literally like watched Steins Gate and all the other like in in universe titles that like Occultic Nine was a part of. It goes, this literally doesn't fucking make sense. And I was just lost. I think I genuinely developed like a, a, a sinus infection <laughs> from like the, the massive headache that I got from from watching that shit. But in terms of, of good media, I do think what makes it good, and it differs from person to person, is how much it resonates with you as a person. Because um, everybody has a different favorite show, a different favorite album, a different favorite game. As much as I think Cowboy Bebop is one of the pinnacle pieces of media in human history, um, a lot of other people would probably say, okay, you're gassing it up too much. Like even fans of Cowboy Bebop was like, okay, that's too much. Uh, but you know the music and it's also an anime that you can watch it dubbed and it's still good the music the animation the, the setting the tone the, the way it's beautifully animated for it's time there's not a lot of animes that I can think of but that's also probably because I, I haven't been watching as much as of recent where I want to buy the whole discography of like the seat belts like the whole seatbelts discography for 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 that show, I I want to own like so badly because it's just so fucking good. Uh, it's just track to track to track to track. Um, and even like the weirder songs, when you think of it in perspective to um each episode or wherever it's used, like it fits. Even if it's strange, it fits in whatever it's using. One one thing in particular is like the horror episode. Um, there's like this. Um, like, I wouldn't even say ominous, like, uh, I'd go as far to say, like, terrifying, like, string ensemble, uh, that's used. And then it, like, feeds into jazz, I think. It's been a while since I listened to that track. But finding media that, that relates to you as a person, which is why I think critics, uh, hello, I'm a star critic, so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think critics should have less importance than they do because you can listen to Anthony Fantano call an album a zero, but you could love that album and you won't know until you listen to that album. I've had so many disagreements with like people I watch, um, like red letter media, um, or fucking donkey. Don like, I think donkey's hilarious. But I think a lot of it, like, I don't agree with, like, a majority of his gaming opinions, genuinely. Um, like, the fact that he disagreed with Nakey Jakey, I wanted to, I wanted, I, I wanted to, to make him kiss the, the front of my fist in anger. Uh, I wanted to punch him, is what I was saying. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you like a shitty album, you like a shitty album, you know? Or, or what is considered a shitty album. And I've come to, to understand that a lot because... I'm a massive fan of Alice in Chains. Um, I'm really starting to grow on uh, Stone Temple Pilots. And a very big thing of, of their music as of recent 
is that Allison Chains doesn't have Lane Staley anymore. They have William Duvall. Um, Stone Temple Pilots doesn't have Scott Weiland anymore. They have <sighs> Jeff Gutt, I think is his name. You know, the, the works that don't have the, the lead singer that passed away definitely don't get as much traction because they were there for Lane. They were there for Scott. And these newer albums, they don't have them. So they don't give them a shot. I personally think like those albums, like all the Alice in Chains albums, Black Gives Way to Blue, Devil Pulled Dinosaurs Here, Rainy or Fog, those are great albums. They are. But because they don't have, you know, Lane Staley, who everyone loved and was a phenomenal singer, you know, I don't think William was trying to replace him or anything. But, but it's a bunch of guys playing music. And if you like the albums, you do. If you don't like the albums, you don't. There's, there's a lot of preconceived opinions that I think prevent us from, from watching media. Oh, this movie by this director was shit. I'm not going to watch his other movies. You know, one bag egg doesn't make the whole batch bad. Or it could. It could. <laughs> <In> the, <laughs> it could be a Neil Breen situation where just all the movies are shit. But, you know, we, we, we have a lot more time on, on Earth than I think we give ourselves credit for. Uh, and, and to an extent, we, if you're a kid listening to this, first off, I don't know why you are. You don't even know who the fuck I am. Uh, <laughs> but most importantly, enjoy your free time. Enjoy the time you have to, to be a kid and, uh, and to play as much video games as you want, to watch as much YouTube as you want, to do the most stupidest shit you can think of just because it's fun. Because eventually, you're going to grow up. You're not going to have time for it. And, and you're going you're gonna to see your time slip away. You're going to see all your friends you have now drift away. You know, it's like you don't know how much free time you have as a kid until it's gone. And uh, it's, it's sad to look back on it. But if you appreciate, you know, if, if you're past childhood and you're an adult now, you know, if you appreciate what you had back then, I, I think that's, that's enough. Um, to, to just appreciate. Jesus Christ. This was supposed to be about elements of good media and bad media. <laughs> I, I just read the next question. And that was kind of in part to, to question number four of the quintessential elements. But all the media I would recommend. <laughs> kind of already did that. But uh, again, if you don't like what I recommend, it's totally up to you, you know? But uh, again, I highly recommend Cowboy Bebop. It's a phenomenal show. It's only 26 episodes. Give this, give the whole soundtrack a listen. You're going to find shit you love, genuinely. In terms of video games, I want to say my favorite indie game is Iconoclasts, uh, which is by Joachim... Fuck, I forget his name. I follow him on Twitter. It's great Metroidvania. It's phenomenal. You play a tinkering teen who uses a wrench to to bash the heads in of enemies, and it's just beautifully animated in pixels. A, a big part of me when it comes to, like, games is, like, I'll like a story, I'll like a soundtrack, but the, the, the big driving force for me is gameplay. Like, if it controls well, if it's intuitive, if, like, if it's a... If it uses fighting elements, if everything like meshes well together and flows nicely, you know, I'll appreciate that more than like if the soundtrack shit <laughs> or, or if the story shit, um, cause I can just like tune my brain off to the story and not give a shit. But if the game plays fun, I'll just continue playing. I'm a sucker for professor Layton. It's, it's more than just being a puzzle game. It's that each puzzle, for the most part, is different from the last. Like, it's not just Sudoku puzzle after Sudoku puzzle, or Picross after Picross after Picross. Like, they're all different. The story and soundtrack, holy shit. The, the story and soundtrack of that game is, is fucking baller. However, if you don't like puzzles, you know, it's very hard to get into the series, like my partner. My partner likes the story, she likes the, mu the, the, the music. The fucking puzzles. <laughs> If you don't like puzzles, it's a very hard game to get through. But thankfully, uh, I love puzzles. Also Uncharted. I love Uncharted. I, I have like two Uncharted statues in my room. I don't think I am in love with them as I originally was as when I started voice acting. But I still very much appreciate the series. I, I, I think I even watched a full playthrough of Golden Abyss for the P PSP or PS Vita. It's fucking one of the handhelds by... PlayStation. I've read the book. 
That's right, there's an Uncharted book. Uncharted, uh, the, the Fourth Labyrinth by Christopher Golden, I think. I, al- I always wanted to do a book dub of it, but it, it's just a lot of work to, to audio engineer, like, all the sound effects to make it look good. Like, it's one thing to just read out the story. It's another thing to, like, get all the voice actors in a Discord server and, like, edit all the sound effects to, like, make it feel immersive, which is what I wanted to do, but it's, I just... It's it's an idea, but I mean, it's I, I don't I don't feel like I can execute it all the way through, with with the same quality throughout. Also, the Yakuza series, um, it's it's kind of like a Japanese soap opera in a way, but it, it's it's you know it's badass. It's a it's it's, it's a badass soap opera, which seems oxymoronic, uh, but fucking love uh, Kiryu Kazuma, love that guy. <laughs> One one goal I set out for myself is like if I ever became like toned, like if if I worked out to the point where I was like fully satisfied with like my muscle toning, I would get the uh the the dragon tattoo he has on the back, which I know would cost a shit ton of money to get done, but uh God, I would love that tattoo. Um but I also realized I probably probably wouldn't be able to to take off my shirt in Japan if that happened. I don't know why I would. But uh, yeah, I'd probably always have to keep a shirt on <laughs> in Japan if I did. I'm a, I'm a huge music nerd. I I love absorbing music. For the most part, I always like try albums. The way I I go through music that I want to listen to, for the most part, I go to to CD stores and I just go, oh, this looks interesting, and I buy the album. So I don't even give like. There are tracks to listen before I buy. I just buy the album and I give it a listen. If I don't like it, I don't like it. But for the most, like I want to say 95% of the time, I've liked the albums that I've bought. Um, and because of that, I've gotten to meet, well, not meet, but I, I've picked up like local albums and, uh, you know, supported those smaller bands. Um, that's how I got into Red Vox by giving them a chance. That's how I got into Alice by giving them a chance. That's how I got into. On, on my YouTube channel, I interviewed Todd the Brand, who made an album called Ocean Levels. And that was, I love that experience of interviewing him. And, and that, you know, that album may not be for you. Like, I didn't think it would be for me. But I mean, what I do a lot is I listen back to albums like over and over. And usually I find like more aspects or songs that I like. Even if on like a first listen, I think it's like only passable. Like it's mediocre. But like the more listens I give it, like there's usually more. I don't want to say nuances, but there's there's more things I appreciate through each path through of a of a full album listen. But in terms of like who I like, uh, I really like uh, the Seattle sound and the alternative rock mu- uh, movement of the '90s. So I want to say my favorite band of all time is Alice in Chains, without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt. Also, like Jerry Cantrell solo work, who's the guitarist of Alice in Chains. I've become a really big fan of Stone Temple Pilots. Uh, but I also really like Pearl Jam. I like Nirvana. I like Soundgarden, Screaming Trees, Silver Chair, Audio Slave's Great. And I've also a pretty big purveyor of metal as well. Slipknot, System of a Down, Megadeth, Kill Switch Engage, Lamb of God. <laughs> I want to say I have a pretty broad range. Also, Soften the Glare. Soften the Glare's great. He has uh it's a basis from Mudvayne, and he does like jazz rock metal fusion it sounds great and i'd love to see them live but they only perform in like north carolina i mean in in terms of 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 good and bad media just give shit a shot even if it's bad you don't know if you'll like it so give it a shot this is a fucking mouthful how is a cultural zeitgeist formed uh (laughs) if you don't know what zeitgeist means it's a sort of like a trend but like on a massive scale so if you want to think back to like the 1950s, 60s, the Beatles were, were the zeitgeist. If you want to think back to the 90s, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana were the zeitgeist. Um, if you want to think to now, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> As for how it's formed, Jesus Christ, I'm not a pseudoscientist, but um, I want to say a large part of it is in a way to fit in. And, and to go with the flow, 
you you do it to fit in and and not feel out of place because everyone else likes it. I don't like beer. I I don't drink it. And I wouldn't be in a situation to where I would do social drinking. But some people drink because it's it's social drinking. They're doing it with others and they want to fit in in a sense. Um, and that can you know be as extreme as as smoking, going to parties or whatever. But in terms of a mass scale as a cultural zeitgeist, God, you're giving me some hard-hitting questions, asshole. <laughs> I do think there has to be some some genuineness uh, of emotion, positive or negative, that, that has to ignite um, the, the Kindle. And people will, will latch on progressively. Because anything has the potential of being a zeitgeist, um, given the right traction, and, you know, they just are lucky enough. In terms of what us humans appreciate and latch on to depends on partially to nature versus nurture, which is a uh, psychological debate of sorts, although honestly I think you there's both, of how you like things based on how you were raised versus intrinsically, meaning you were like born with the inclination to like the things you like. Uh, versus how you were raised to like the things you like. So 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 that's the basis of it. And and one thing with uh I, at least the the Catholic theology that I heavily disagree with is that intrinsically all humans follow the same code of ethics, which is in my personal opinion not correct. You're free to disagree. But but ethics in a way can also be very personalized. Because let's say without a, a system with laws uh, in a country, ethics would very much be formed person to person based on personal preferences and what they feel is right on personal justice. Because there will always be people that are like, pedophiles are fine. <laughs> there, there will always be like the 1%. There's still going to be a very small amount of people that are like, it's okay to fuck your dog. I... And the majority of other people don't think it's okay to fuck your dog, but there's always there's always going to be different people with different differing opinions, and and that's what makes us human. Um, as as much as it, as, as much as opinions can divide us, it is also what unites us. If we all agreed with the same things, I mean, we'd we'd be more so a hive mind than a human. So it's it's the differences that make us shine, uh, good or bad. But I do think, especially in at least our culture right now, there is a very high significance of wealth and, and trying to attain wealth or showing you have wealth. Because mo money and, and the whole process of, of economics has and ha has been a very central part of, of global affairs. Like every, almost every single part of the world, I'm sure there's like a very small city that, you know, still use bartering, but almost like every single part of the world has some sort of currency and buying function and that's not even taking into account whether they're capitalistic or communistic or socialistic or whatever um but there there's still like some sort of like money processing because goods and services need to be rewarded with something given back and if they weren't given back uh you know people would abuse the system of just like constantly getting 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 without giving you could go back into like a uh, personalized ethics back then of just like I think it's morally fine to keep taking and not give or some bullshit like that. In a way, I do think we we lose a bit of humanity when when we attach these zeitgeists to more materialistic facets of our life. It's one thing to to follow the zeitgeist of. I, I don't know if this would fall into a zeitgeist, but the um, the followings of Martin Luther King Jr. and his speeches and how it eventually led to the equality of, of, of most races over a long period of time, which we're still healing from. I don't think we'll ever heal from uh, just because we're humans and everybody's going to be different with forgiveness. And that's okay. But there's also the, the, the cultural zeitgeist on a much, 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 much smaller scale. Let's say fucking silly bands. 
if anybody remembers that, silly bands. The rubber bands that were shaped like animals or objects or fucking whatever. I wasn't into that. Um, I think that was also around the same time as as uh, as Rainbow Loom, but that in a way is is a <laughs> at least a a consumer zeitgeist. That definitely, like when when you go towards a more material zeitgeist, you know, it's more so about fitting in than doing what you feel you relate to or what you like. So, you know, <laughs> the, the the zeitgeist of Muhammad or the zeitgeist of of Jesus Christ or the zeitgeist of Buddha or whatever. So as much as, you know, I also personally think we should all treat each other better, um, there also comes a realization of just how wide and vast each human is um, on a personal, intrinsic level. And uh, it's, it's a pretty tall order to ask for the acceptance of an entire race of people, an entire religion of people, an entire whatever of, of people. But having a cultural zeitgeist that, that's just like the hot topic at the time that everyone can relate to, that is material, yet we can't like agree on, on, a, on a human right in, in a sense. So to tune it down like by 11, <laughs> I'll talk about my experiences with, with YouTube and, and Newgrounds and Twitch and the internet overall. Definitely my first experience with Newgrounds was, uh, was watching Zone Animations. So definitely porn, definitely hentai and porn was uh, was my first introduction to Newgrounds. But I mean, outside of Newgrounds, and more so like the creators from Newgrounds that eventually went to make bigger things, you know, Castle Crashers was massive. I don't think I played Alien Hominid, but there does there was like some social impact there. But I also was a massive like flash game player as a kid too. So there, there might have been stuff from Newgrounds that was eventually ported to like uh, Addicting Games, which I played a lot of, or other websites that just took Flash games from that website, or they just posted it elsewhere that I just didn't realize at the time was originally created there. If I'm being honest, I don't think I'm as big as a proprietor of Newgrounds as I should be. Um... I definitely think I could do more. Like I need to go on the art portal more and and uh the video portal and the game portal and and play more. But uh I'm also in the middle of 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 doing classes and job hunting at the same time, so I don't uh you know. <laughs> I say that as I watch like 6 hours of YouTube <laughs> in in a row. But I'm I'm super thankful of Newgrounds because it is in a way its own <laughs> sphere. Uh I do like my partner and a couple of other people I know are scared to join it because, you know, their art may not mesh with the, the general uh, feelings and uh, consensus of the, of the website. So they, so they go to Tumblr versus Twitter, which is fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, get, I get that perception. But it's also just been like a great place from the get-go of, of releasing purely creative ideas, whether it be audio, art uh music or 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 video games or animated movies like it's always been creative based not like human based if 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 that makes sense cuz i mean like no one's posting vlogs on newgrounds that that's just like them talking to a camera going i've made a serious error in my choice of actions or whatever bullshit so i'm extremely glad uh newgrounds exists for a variety of reasons. One of the biggest reasons is Georgia's success. I don't think Stickman 2020 would have ever have gotten as big as it did without Newgrounds. Meeting the guys there, being lucky enough to to meet Jeff, Johnny Utah, Corey Spaz Kid, Tom Fulp of all people. The fucking God, he's the genuinely the nicest human being alive, without a doubt. But just meeting all all those people and, and seeing their creative efforts and seeing like how emotionally connected they are to their projects that take years to put out because they're just so good and they take effort and it's more than just shitting stuff out, which, you know, there's still that product on a new grounds from time to time. You're definitely going to see people that just shit out content or just re-upload from their YouTube. Um, but there are genuine creators that just pour their their... I don't want to say their their heart and soul. I mean, there are some people that are like that, but I mean, 
there's just some genuinely creative and talented people on the website that I don't think you get to experience with the algorithms of Twitter and YouTube. So forever grateful to, to Newgrounds, even if I don't use it as much as a majority of the other users. I mean, what, what can I say about YouTube? Um, I mean, it's, it's a platform and it's not run the best, but I mean, it's, it's stuck around. It's stuck the fuck around. I think over 10 years, over 15 years, maybe. I don't remember. But it's, it's been around for a fucking long time as, as like the premier video web, uh, website. I, I said in the beginning, but I mean, like Minecraft YouTubers, like God is Minecraft and his group. I've watched a lot of, um, I should probably pull up my YouTube so I, so I can talk about my, like who I subscribe to. Cause this actually, I've kind of dreamed about talking about the, the people that I'm subscribed to and like who I'm inspired by. I, I, I definitely was like a purveyor of, of Game Grumps at a time. They were a very big part. I, I think I started watching them towards the end of the John era. And I just eventually fell out of their stuff. I also really don't like a lot of the members that are still there. They still formatted me as a person, whether I like it or not. Early Super Mega, I don't like much of their, their new stuff now. And Oni plays, of course, watch a shit ton of that. But also all the, all the animators there, like Psychic Pebbles and Oni and G, fucking Tom Scott too. Just all those those Newgrounds animators that I watched on YouTube, but were you know originally from from Newgrounds, just mwah. love that shit. So watch so much of it. One of my favorite foreign YouTubers is a uh, Sushira Riku, uh, who's a Japanese YouTuber who's just fucking bonkers. <laughs> He's just fucking bonkers. It's the best way I can describe it. I consume a lot of vine sauce. So Vinny, I watch Joel. I watch. Uh, Jabroni Mike, I watch Limes, I watch pretty much everyone on there. Uh, Rev. Cold Ones, I watch a lot of. Off Canny is a great channel. They're sort of in a way, I, I don't know how to fully describe it, but they're funny. God the Waz is great. Love that guy. I met him a couple of times. He's a genuinely nice person. Brutal Moose and Cadigorous, I've been watching for years. I've definitely grown to like Brutal Moose a lot more because editing is just, it's so fun. It's so fun. Dark Domain is also a really great channel. I've been watching Miss Breezy, who was originally like Cool Dude for a while. And uh, they were kind of one of the people that helped me uh, grasp LGBTQIA+, which, you know, <laughs> feels like taboo for saying. But, uh, but yeah, I mean acceptance to, to that degree depending on like how you're raised you know watching them transition is is cool and nice and i'm glad i got to to watch that happen i love nakey jakey fucking love that guy anytime he uploads it's just like i'm gonna pop popcorn i'm gonna grab a nice big soda pop and sit down and just enjoy the the whole experience because it's just god amazing ordinary sausage bite-sized videos but i mean like it's just enough to to be like I want to know what a dozen roses in a sausage casing tastes like. Zero out of five. My favorite YouTube poop is a series. It's the adventure, the misadventures of Skooks. By far my favorite YouTube poop ever. Internet common etiquette with Eric. Worthy kids. Punk duck. Neocranium. Seven. Oh, I love seven. seven. Seven's a very, very small skit channel. I highly recommend you watch seven. Michael Reeves, Senior Palo, Settled, who who does uh who does RuneScape videos. The Mexican runner who does who does Twitch streams. Phenomenal speedrunner. Anani Moose. Fucking Cow Chop when they used to upload. Oh man. Loved Cow Chop. Miles John, who I forgot to mention when talking about Newgrounds because he's on both, but guy is super talented. I, lo I love his style. He's very eclectic, and I love it. HealthyGamer.gg from, from Dr. K, I think, is a super great site on, on YouTube to just learn on, on, a, on a professional level of, of, of mental things. Because even if you don't have a gaming addiction... Um, it's just really insightful stuff that I was recommended when I was in a really dark place. Very thought provoking. And it just helps you just start moving in, in a direction. All the science channels, 
like William Osmond, Alan Pan, Backdoor Scientist, I'm sorry, Backyard Scientist, uh, Nile Red, just, and, and their podcast, Safety Third. They're quirky guys. And while I'm not a science guy, it's, it's just cool seeing them be quirky. One of my favorite cooking channels, because I do watch Binging with Babish, but I love Alex, uh, who used to be French Guy Cooking. Uh, he does these super large deep dives into, like, he gets, like, really focused on certain foods. Like, he had a 10-episode series or so about meatballs and, like, how to make the perfect meatball. And he went to, to Sweden, and he had kufta, and he went to Turkey, and he had their version he, you know, he just does a deep dive and he's just super thorough and very interesting. He, he did a series on dry pasta. <laughs> it's, it's boring on face value, but I, I, I find it very, very interesting. A guilty pleasure is epic rap battles of history. I met those guys too. Even if it's silly, you got to admit there's a lot of effort put into those videos. If I haven't said it already, Germa, love me, Germa, uh, love, love me some Germa. Michael Cthulhu, who does these really long videos of, of making giant weapons. It's just, <laughs> it's just fun. Oh, fuck, I forgot to mention. Uh, Sky Williams is a massive influence on my editing style when I used to edit. Um, and I loved his content. And you know, he's been through a lot of drama recently that I, you know, in my opinion, he's gotten clear of. Uh, but very very big purveyor of 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 my comedy and editing and then when it comes to twitch uh i i watch a lot of speedrunners sometimes just like in the background while i'm working on something else so i can look over and see how their paces uh there's there's a good handful of people that i that i follow if i was to to recommend one channel that i haven't already mentioned oh why didn't I think of this? Wayne Radio TV. He's got phenomenal streams. They're very creative. You're always going to have a laugh when you watch his stuff. If you haven't already followed him. He did the Half-Life uh, VR, uh, but the AI is Sentient series. <laughs> I've been gracious enough to, to meet a lot of great people um, over my time living as a human being. A big part of that is going to too many games, which is somewhat local to me every year. Fuck, I, I got to meet Kadikaris, and he signed my copy of, of Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. I loved that. I talked to, to Scott the Waz a couple of times when he was there. I had a question about his Donkey Kong Barrel Blast video uh, with the Donkey Kong drums and like why he decided to, to make it a correlation to being celibate or being a sex freak. <laughs> And we and we had a somewhat long conversation about that because it was it was a very interesting writing process. And uh, he's I mean, he's more than just a funny guy. He's he he's very thoughtful. I fucking got to meet Vinny, I think, twice now. And the second time I met him, I cried a little bit. Genuinely loved meeting that guy. And he gave, he gave me a shit ton of confidence to to pick up an instrument and, and just try shit. It's just God. What a what a wonderful human being he is. Yeah, uh, I, I met ERB. And I, I talked to them a little bit when I was insecure about my editing. They sort of reaffirmed me. They were they were both super like nice Peter and Epic Lloyd. Super nice people. I, I've always gone to the Psycho Stick concert at too many games, and those guys are, you know, meanwhile, very talented people. Especially Josh, who's on guitar, and, and Alex. I think it's Maddie. Yeah. Uh, on bass, just all super talented. Like even those silly music, like s silly lyrics, like the music is is serious. Like they they take their actual like music playing great. I went to a live show to see Alice in Chains, and uh, thankfully I got into the pit. And by the time they actually played, I somehow got like at the front the of like where the barrier was, so I was like as close as I possibly could be to them, and it was just surreal. Like I they didn't say hi to me or anything, but I mean just. Just being like literally like almost six feet away from like where they're playing. It's just, whoa. And finally, the story that I've told many times, and I'm sure the, the story uh, most people want me to tell, the time I met Christine Chandler, also known as Chris Chan. This was before they were arrested. <laughs> it was... 
Too Many Games 2019. I think it had just opened for the day. Like, I always go through the uh, the booths to see, like, who's open and do, like, window shopping before I decide to, like, where to buy from. I was passing by this place that sold t-shirts and then had a small side shop of, of video games. As I was walking by, I saw this, this person with a v- very similar getup to to Chris Chan. And I was like, wow, that's that's really good cosplay. I stared at it for five more seconds. I'm like, oh shit, that's that's no, that's not a cosplay. That's Chris Chan. I think I debated with myself for a little bit. I'm like, if I go to them, what the fuck am I gonna talk about? To me, all I knew them for they were just like legend. Like I didn't I didn't watch any of their stuff. I didn't follow like too much of the drama, but I knew like just the meme that was Chris Chan. So like if I say hi to them, what the fuck am I gonna talk about? And by the time I asked myself that, I was already like to them saying, hi, Chris. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, hi, Chris, I'm a big fan of your work. And they say, well, how do you do? It's just nice to meet a fellow fan or something along those lines. It was so fucking long ago. Well, it wasn't that long ago. It was like, what, four years ago? <laughs> After that, it was just like a very short period of silence. I think I asked them like what they were working on or like how they were doing. And if they were enjoying the convention, then it was just a short period of, of silence. And I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to take it too much of your time. It was nice meeting you. And they go, now hold on. And they, and they pull out this, this little, um, you know, those bags you, you, uh, you keep like magazines in, like, it's not a purse. It's not like a duffel bag and it's not a plastic bag, it's sort of like a burlap bag. I don't, I don't know. Don't peek, but you could take one little surprise gift from here. <laughs> To be honest, I was a little bit scared because like fucking anything could be in here. Um, so I didn't look, and I pulled out like this little, uh, less than an inch tall figure of, of Vision from 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 Marvel Com- from Marvel Comics, and and Chris goes, "Oh yeah, Vision, mm, it's a cool figure." Okay, see ya. And I left, and I just took a couple of section- seconds going like, I could have taken a picture with them. I could have taken a picture with them. And then I found out that later that day they tried kissing one of their fans. In fact, I think they tried kissing multiple people. <laughs> or hugging multiple people. I, I don't remember the case. <laughs> I, I'm sort of glad, but also not fully glad that I didn't get a picture. Because all I have is a story. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of, of like actual comedians that have influenced me, I guess. When I was, I want to say, 8th or 7th grade, I discovered Bo Burnham's What on YouTube. I loved it so much. I rewatched that special over and over and over until I had memorized the entire set, word per word. Like um, one of his, uh, his poems. Uh, sluts! Sluts! It's not a roll call. Sluts! Sluts, no fans and or butts, I like sluts, I like sluts. Nice girls are nice, but no good for nut sucking. They'll need a serene night to green light a butt fucking, but that would be easy with sleazy old slut fucking boo to the nice girls. Praise be to slut fucking. I have a list. A list? Yes, a list of all these sluts I've missed. I never fucked or sucked these sluts, so thus my nuts are fucking pissed. So when I fuck the lucky slut, my nut removes her from the list. Another dumb cum bucket struck from my nut sucking suck slut fucking suck it slut fucking bucket list. He he was a big influence. I didn't like uh make happy as much and inside was definitely more depressing than funny like after that special i was just more sad than than content i was a little late to the party but norm mcdonald i originally found his work when he was playing the character pigeon on mike tyson mystery team which i highly recommend you watch it is a lot more funny than i think people give it credit for but also his jokes are are just super dry but hilarious the joke that I think of when, when I talk about him is uh, when he was talking about Andy Richter on, on Conan O'Brien. Oh, there was this, uh, this miner. He was visiting this mining town. And he, want, he wanted to settle down. And he, goes, he, go, he goes to the bar, and he, and he goes to the bartender, and he says, Gosh darn, I can't seem to, can't seem to find any pretty ladies uh, over here. And I... I you know, I gotta settle down with, with somebody. And he goes, well, you ain't gonna find any ladies here. There's a town full of fruity men. It's him that said it, not me. I think. I could, I could be embellishing. He goes, well, 
Yeah, you sure you only have many? He goes, well, we, we, have, we have Andy Richter. And he goes, ah, I'll pass. And he goes down to the mines. He mines for another 20 years. And eventually he breaks down. He goes back to the bar after those 20 years, and he goes to the bartender. And he goes, all right. All right, you broke me. I'll take Andy Richter. But you got to promise me, nobody has got to know about it. And the bartender goes, well, it's already too late. Four people know about it if you do it. He goes, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you would know it. I would know it. Andy Richter would know it. And so would the guy who is holding Andy Richter down. I kind of feel guilty for saying it now. <laughs> I also love Gilbert Gottfried. Phenomenal guy. More than just his voice acting. He was funny. Love that guy. Super sad that they both passed. And also Bob Saget. What is art? <laughs> More like, what is fart? <laughs> no. Art has to have some form of meaning behind it. Some form of intent. I think when I touch this topic, I'm inevitably going to, to bring up AI. Because that's just the, the climate of today. On a scientific scale... AI art is still art, in parentheses. But in terms of a, you know, if, if you're going to go to the artistic renaissance, <laughs> you know, the, it's definitely not going to be considered art. Especially because it takes pools from other sources to create the art that you're requesting. The reason we create is because we're inspired from other pieces, which were inspired from previous pieces, which were inspired from so forth and so on. You can make that argument. However... There is a reason behind those pieces being made, even if it's inflation porn. <laughs> so even if, if it's just to make money, there, there's... Hentai is art still. But I mean, it goes beyond that. You know, music, movies, animation, even like like performance, like, like plays or... or uh... Uh, the fucking one performance artist of a uh, of a lady just slipping on butter for twenty minutes, and I, I almost feel afraid to talk about AI because I don't I don't feel versed enough. It's funny, right? Like we we've all seen the video of the uh, of the Burger King. Like Burger King's the only place where you can fuck this burger. This burger is so much estrogen it'll turn your tits to the size of basketballs. Come to Burger King where we'll fuck your ass six. Where we'll fuck your stupid ass six ways from Sunday. It's hilarious, right? Because it's it's the exact voice, and he's saying silly shit, but it's still AI. And it's like, would we consider that art? Intrinsically, I want to say no, but I feel like with some wordplay, you could convince me otherwise to to, to like sit on the fence. So I personally don't feel like I'm I'm the person to 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 give a certified answer to what is art again in such a climate as today. Even if AI art was decidedly art, I do think it's sad for people to have to generate art instead of progressing and getting better themselves. I'm not ashamed or disappointed in the robot creating the AI art. I'm ashamed of the people using the AI, the AI to create art. Because they're cutting out the middleman. They're cutting out all the hard work, right? Because it's easier to just do use the AI art. It's easier than like spending five years getting progressively better at art, depending on like how much you draw every day. And even after five years, it may not be like the, the quality you want. It could take 10 years. It could take 15. It could take a multitude of years to get to the point where you're satisfied. But, you know, you just cut out the middleman and, and, you, and you just do AI and then you call it your art. There's one thing I can say about AI art, and it is without a doubt soulless. There is no soul in it. I do think that is undisputable. Unless, like, you want to bring up a quote from, like, do do robots dream of clockwork or, or something like that. I think any piece of media can be considered art to at least you if it elicits some sort of, I don't want to say reaction or emotion, but it elicits something from you. And some art is better than others. Like, uh, like the picture of Piss Jesus. <laughs> It's a, I think it's a crucifix. 
it's a picture of a crucifix and just a jar of of urine, if I remember correctly, and, and that still is technically art. But it it almost harkens back to 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 preferences of a human being and like what you like. Because does the definition of what is art really matter at the at the end of the day? To an extent, yes. But at the same time, there are many facets of of each of our lives that we need to to give focus to, whether it's to ourselves or to our friends or family or strangers that are in need. I think it takes a lot of 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 insight and selflessness to to take something like if if this is very true to yourself defining what is art and and trying to find a true definition you you know that's you and you can't change that and that's fine to think that way but i do think it's it's more noble if you feel that way and you still put more earthly matters uh, that that connect us more as as human beings um before being a, a philosopher of sorts the typical day in life of, of kind of Drake is pretty drab and boring. Used to be wake up and do schoolwork for like eight hours. And that was my life back in May of 2020 up until I want to say January. And then I did a couple of more classes uh, to become a, a calibration laboratory engineer. Uh, which I know probably means nothing to most of you guys, but just know that uh, uh, it pays well. <laughs> uh, so, so for a lot of my time, it was it was wake up and do school, <laughs> eat a TV dinner, uh, listen to YouTube, jack off, watch YouTube. It's I don't, I don't have an exuberant lifestyle. I should work out. I don't. I should read more. I don't. I should practice meditation more. I don't. I go to therapy. I take meds. <laughs> drink water. I drink a lot of water. I actually got back on energy drinks recently, sadly. I try to keep it to just one drink a day, and that's like 200 milligrams, which is like around four cups of coffee. But I just keep it to, to one a day usually, and I try to take a break on weekends. But uh, because I'm recording like <laughs> over two hours of audio today, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking some energy drink. So pardon. On weekends, I, I help around the house. I'm, I'm lucky enough to where my parents let me stay with them while I'm trying to sort my life out, have enough money and credit to, to buy my own apartment space, or at some point, hopefully get my own home, which I know is a dream for my generation, but uh, it's, it's still possible. Highly unlikely, but still possible. Right now, I'm, I'm actually building a Gundam. Not presently, but I mean like a like what I'm doing in my off time. I've been playing uh, Cosmic Shake, the, the new Spongebob game. I'm achievement hunting. <laughs> Cookie Clicker and Idol Slayer. I, I play Dead by Daylight with my, with my partner, uh, sadly. <laughs> I both like and hate that game. I don't love it. I like it sometimes. I have a stockpile of CDs I have yet to listen to. So like after a week, I'll, I'll pick out a CD and sit down and listen to it because I feel... The best way to, to listen to music is to like sit down and give it your full attention um, is, is the best way to, to give it proper justice. Because if you're doing something and you're not given the, the full attention to either task, which is like humans can theoretically multitask, but you're not doing either task 100%. I don't think I'm all that spectacular on a, on a day-to-day basis. I, I live and breathe. I wake up in the morning begrudgingly. I do what I can, and hopefully that's enough for, for myself. I feel like I'm being called out, but, uh, but this next one is personality traits and people I despise. I am a sucker for, for justice and, and, uh, and doing what's right. I try my best to, to do what I feel is right or try to educate myself to learn what is right, and sometimes it's a, <laughs> it's a detriment if I do that. But it depends on like what side of the fence you're talking to, of course. I do feel like whatever traits I despise is a uh, is also sort of like a nurture versus nature thing. Although I would say it's more so nurture. Being being raised a uh, Catholic, uh, 
instills a lot of principles in you from growing up and it takes a lot of unlearning to to become more accepting of other people uh when you're when you're at that basis one thing i i try to get better at is is be more understanding of of pride and being proud of yourself because there's there's too little and too much of everything if you don't give yourself enough pride you're going to undervalue yourself you're not going to think you're worth it you're going to develop symptoms of depression of anxiety, of other negative symptoms, and you're not going to believe in yourself. However, if you're too stuck up your own ass, you're unbearable. <laughs> For me, it's it's been hard to do. I'm I'm very much on on the on the on the former than on the latter. I, I'd like to assume I really don't give myself that much credit. So when I hear other people praise themselves, I intrinsically, on instinct, I immediately go ugh. Gross. When really, when in reality, no. They're, you know, it's good to be proud of things. I don't think it's good to be excessively proud of things to the point of like demeaning others. Like I'm better than you. But there is value in in pride. Being content with yourself. There's only one person you're stuck with within your entire life, and that's yourself. How are you going to love or treat anybody else correctly if you can't even treat yourself right? You know, that also builds into trying to give yourself enough self-care, but also not being overbearing on it. Too much self-care, you keep putting things off, overeat, you indulge yourself. There's constant indulgement, which a gluttonous cycle if you're not careful. So it's, it's still something very hard to manage, and, and I envy those who, who properly manage like the right amount of self-care while still understanding like what you can be accountable for on a day-to-day -day basis how much i can get done in a day without beating myself up or being too lazy it's also just like an, another thing to just be kind to people anger is is one of the easiest emotions to feel and it takes a lot of strength to be compassionate especially to those that that wrong you and while i'm not a purveyor of of Catholic teachings, I do think some of the intrinsic ideologies do hold some worth um, on a on a on a non-religious level, on a, on a somewhat ethical level, you could say. Like on instinct, we want revenge when something is wrong to us, but it takes so much strength, inner strength, to just like accept and move past without like holding resentment and just forgiving. It takes a lot. But that doesn't make the people you hate any less unbearable. Like, I understand people that bully other people usually have a reason for why they're doing it because of their own home situations or how they're raised. Depending on, like, how they're treated can be sad. But, you know, that still doesn't distinguish the fact that, you know, they're, they're still bullying others. And I feel like from a somewhat young age, I want to say, like, teenage age, I, I've grasped the idea that, like, we all go, th go through shit. The teacher you don't like that's treating you unfairly, you got to think to yourself, are they content with their life? Are they happy? Maybe they're not trying to exactly taking it out on you in particular. They might be, but we all have to put up with shit. And it, it, it takes a lot of, of thought to, to just realize we're all human. We all go through, through motions and, and shit. Especially like a, one thing I see a lot is like comparatives. It's so like, oh, my depression's worse than your depression. Well, that might be the case, but my anxiety is worse than your anxiety. It's like, at the end of the day, it sucks to have either. It sucks to want to kill yourself. It doesn't matter how many more times you, you've attempted to end your life versus somebody else who's like never attempted, but, have, but has, has several ideologies of doing it. You know, at the end of the day, it sucks. No one should have to go through that. It's, it's probably one of the lowest places you could go in terms of, of self-worth. And it's, it's a very dark place to be. So all it takes a lot of effort, and sometimes you have to fake it. I wouldn't say you have to lie, but just trying to be kind as, as much as you can is one of the best ways to fix it. And at the end of the day, it very much holds true that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. It is possible for people to change, but they are the only people to initiate it. 
and it will come naturally. Or it may never come at all. That's just how it works. I feel the best memes are just pictures, no text. Because I feel the more universal the picture is, um, the more effective it is. That can pass through any language barrier, just seeing an emotion. Uh, like pain.png, it's a great one. Uh, <laughs> this is currently my Steam profile. It's a uh, it's a picture of of Jeff that that Chris drew on the first uh, slightly artistic from from Oni Plays. There's this image I have on my face. I, I have it rotated uh, a couple of times. If if I got enough traction on Twitch, this would probably be like the only emote I would have. Smug poo is great. I love smug poo. Smug poo is smug poo is a great reaction image. Pepe Hum is great. Cause like I'll be like, what if what if you put the fork in the garbage disposal? Uh, I love the red letter media depressed on the couch. Love that. It's a great, great image as well. This one is from a frame of, of undercover brother. <laughs> I don't know what feeling it elicits, but uh <laughs> And then I think my favorite genre of of memes is the Yoshi kissing toad, also from Slightly Artistic, drawn by by Dave Phantom Arcade, who's also a great guy. Any iterations of this are are just phenomenal. I have I have one of my own of of Scooby Doo kissing the dog from from Alien Invaders. <laughs> It's, I love it. <laughs> well, after this, I'm I'm gonna be streaming a, a Danganronpa game, so I guess I'll talk about that. Danganronpa is a shitty series. I feel like it's dropped the ball so many times on a narrative standpoint that it's just abhorrent to experience. It's it's more egregious when it's a visual novel like Danganronpa. And it does the 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 Phoenix Wright thing where they want particular answers when you're when you're in the when you're in the court section, which to an extent, you know, I get, you know, there needs to be set answers, but sometimes it, it just feels like it's grasping for straws. But spoiler alert for for the entire series. The the main villain, Junko Onishima, is given the Blackbeard treatment of One Piece, where in the world of Danganronpa, there are teenagers that are ultimate levels. So, like, there's an ultimate swimmer. But she gets to have two. So, she's a fashion designer, but also the ultimate... So, she's the ultimate fashionista, but also the ultimate analyst. And she's so good at analyzing that there's no point of doing anything because she already knows the outcome. So, she doesn't enjoy anything except for despair because that makes sense the most bullshit part of the plot is that there's this throw throwaway character that's in, that's integral to the whole plot of the series and he's only in the anime he's called the ultimate animator don't remember his name even though the reason why he's the ultimate animator is because he was he somehow got like a government algorithm uh, to where it sort of like forces your brain to elicit an emotion. And it's like you're not the ultimate animator if you have to use an algorithm for people to like your fucking animations, dumbass. And so Junko gets a hold of it and uses it to mind control the whole world and cause the 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 ultimate despair fucking whatever. And it's just such a stupid fucking plot. Like to to find the reason of why all this happens to be so abhorrently idiotic. I feel like I'm Benoit LeBlanc from, from Glass Onion. Right? <laughs> it's just so fucking stupid. How do you come to a conclusion like that? Like, I feel you, you, were, you were given a fucking sandbox, right? You were, you were given a sandbox to give us a reason, a somewhat credible reason, right? It doesn't have to be fully set in logic, right? But you fucking took the cat turd that was in the sandbox. You didn't make a sandcastle. You took a cat turd and you fucking put it in the disc. That's Dong and Rampa. Shittiest fucking visual novel series to exist. Jesus fucking Christ.
favorite character is Gundam Tanaka, by the way. All right, it's time for recommendations. Uh, I'll try to go like in between each, or maybe I should just do all YouTube first, and then all new grounds. I don't have a ton of new grounds because, as I've said, I, I I don't spend as much time on here as I should. But uh, but one thing, one of one of my fucking favorite animations on here is from the Smash collab uh, of New Grounds. It's it's Pac Man sitting on a chair, and then Bowser comes in. And he goes, "Hey, Pac Man." What if I just took a fucking shit on your carpet? Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't that be funny? Wouldn't that be, be so funny? And then there's the ending song where he just goes, I'm feeling hungry, feel my tummy rumbly. I fucking love to eat shit. And then he starts eating shit out of the toilet, and it's fucking hilarious. I love it. <laughs> I love I love that. <laughs> it's so good. I gotta shout out Detective Grimoire, which eventually became its own series, both games on Steam. The last game in the series is called Tangle Tower, and that one's phenomenal. Love that. I played that one on stream. The game before it, I think, was also called Detect Detective Grimoire, but there's, one, there's a Flash one by the same developers on Newgrounds, and that one is really fun, and it's, it's cool to see like where they came from. Also, Figure Fumble, which is, like, a newer release. So addicting. Really fun. I think it works best on mobile. Uh, again, I don't, I don't think I'm the person to, to recommend new ground stuff, and I apologize for that. The one thing I will say, do it yourself. <laughs> I, don't give me any credit, all right? Just, you'll probably find better stuff going through it than I would. Also... Newgrounds has a lot of porn. So if you run out of material, go to, go to Newgrounds. All right, first video I want to mention from YouTube that I love is uh, the video of the guy getting like half a, a, a container of mustard sprayed on his face. And it takes him so long to realize that he's getting sprayed with mustard. It takes so long. He's almost drowning in it. And he goes, what the fuck? Oof. Oof. What, what the fuck, man? <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a great video. I mentioned this channel earlier, but Seven. Seven is a skit channel, as I said before. Their best skit, I quote it all the time. It is called, Mr. Binklebop is a hack, and I made this video to expose his crimes. And it's a man who, who argues with a sock puppet because he's asking the sock puppet to hand him his, char uh, to hand him his laptop charger. And he goes, no. Excuse me? <laughs> I said, no. And they just have an argument to the point where he goes, give me my card. No, please. I am an armless puppet. It's hilarious. Love that video. Absolute pinnacle, uh, I forget to mention, is is the Super Ghostbusters album by by Joey Vine Sauce, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Vark Skelf or Joel. Um, it's it's a psychotic album, <laughs> but <laughs> but I I think it's I think it's a I think it's great. <laughs> I think I, I listen to it every now and then. It's it's pretty funny. I, I love all of Nikki Jakey's videos, but if I was to to recommend one, I would do the Nikki Jakey esports video. One word, gamers. Two words, gamers, gamers. Three words, gamers, gamers, pro gamers. We're talking about the last one. <laughs> also, if you haven't seen it already, even though like I, I praise George a lot. Please watch his Blockstorm video. Uh, get get more people to play Blockstorm. It's it's a silly game, but but play Blockstorm. It's good game. Also, if I can recommend the We Went to Newgrounds video, if you want a better idea of my relationship with George and like how much fun we have together doing absolutely stupid shit, just watch the We Went to Newgrounds video. I love that. My favorite video with George is uh, we made a pizza. I think it's, 
It might be his pinnacle work. We made a pizza is is, is his pinnacle, in in my opinion. I I love that video. Another great one is a uh, sorry can't talk right now. I'm making piss. So I don't want to say that that inside of me was in a different It's a short video, but I love it. Another one I quote a lot is the smart parody of psycho so- cycle psychosocial. Being gay and talking balls. Fuck my ass against the wall. Make me drink your pee. Bust a load of puzzles sleeping in me. Sucking penis. His return to, to YouTube after a long period is uh, Punk Duck's How to Metal Gear Solid. It, it, go, it goes over like why all the games are good in their own respect. And as someone who wanted to try to get into it despite it seeming very daunting, it's, it's a very good video on like why the series is as, is as good as it is. If you haven't seen it already, it's a video called Schnip Schnapp. S C H N I P space S C H N A P P, and it's this dancing skeleton with a uh, German man sing yelling at you. Yeah, that, <laughs> it's so good. This feels like a self insert, but it's not me. Um, I speed run a game called Clue Finders: Third Grade Adventures: The Mystery of Mathra. I I'm in second place, but the first place holder, Aqua Baby, did a phenomenal run. That uh, I don't think will be beat. Give it a watch. It's like only it's only ten minutes long, which I don't think back when I started the game would ever be possible. But it is somehow. I know I said off canny the channel earlier, but I mean like if we're talking one video, I I want to say thousand thank thousand dollar Thanksgiving cookoff is phenomenal. <laughs> Film Cal does not get the rep they should. They have been amazing for years <laughs> there's so many i could recommend uh professor toothy is great the walrus song is great the robber the robber i quote almost on a daily basis the marshmallow people trilogy i also quote on a daily basis Th- there are just so many good videos by them also cupcake pals i quote a lot Ah, you guys, you guys. I touched on this a little bit earlier about my music tastes, um, about being into uh, uh, grunge and metal. I'll talk briefly about my music journey. I wasn't raised musically. Instruments in our in our family line. Uh, my brother did play trumpet. I think he played a little bit of piano, and then eventually he picked up guitar. In terms of myself, my parents would ask me, like, if there was any instrument I wanted to play growing up, but I mean, there wasn't, like, I didn't have any musical inspirations. It took me years to find any guitar music, whether that be rock or metal or any, anything with guitar in it. Like, I didn't know about the Beatles until third grade. And by know about the Beatles, I mean, like, by name. My friends were talking about Yellow Submarine. By the Beatles, and I'm like, like the insect, and they're like, no, the band. I'm like, what do you mean the band? <laughs> like, if I wasn't ostracized enough, I didn't know the Beatles, one of the most infamous bands in human history. One of the earliest artists I think I listened to was Kitsune Squared. Maybe I, I guess they're techno dance or just techno. I, I don't know. But I listened to, I listened to Square Dance a shit ton. And I think that's what accidentally got me into the brony fandom. I was a brony for a little bit, if you can believe it, as a kid. And then I eventually faded out of it towards before high school started easily. But there was there was a phase where I was I was watching all the new uh, My Little Pony episodes every every Saturday morning. <laughs> not not my proudest moment. My actual music revelation came from George back when we were using Skype, posted a meme video of Spongebob singing Chop Suey. And something in my brain went, wait, I heard this before. As a good thing, like a nostalgia flare. And uh, it threw me back to when I used to go to the public pool and they would be playing the, like, the radio. And they, I think they played 
Chop Suey and BYOB a couple of times. Because when I listened to BYOB, I got the same feeling. And I was like, this is like, something's clicking here. I would listen to music before. And I'm like, wow, this sounds good. But it wouldn't click the same way System of a Down click. They were the first band I fell in love with. So I listened to like all their albums like back to back. I listened to Self Titled, then Toxicity, then Steal This Album, then Hypnotize and Mesmerize, which again, all those albums are great. <laughs> it's sad that we'll probably never get another album, but uh, sometimes it's good to just leave it at five. <laughs> I eventually met Chris one of the friends in our group that is friends with me and George, and he recommended me Megadeth, so I got into a little bit of Megadeth. Avenged Sevenfold, but, like, not a lot. By this time, I was still under the pretense that, like, some metal bands were satanic, like Slipknot. <laughs> like, I, I was under that pretense, because, you know, raised Catholic. Back when I used to do, like, meme edits of, of songs, like mashups, I did a mashup of Lazy Town and Psychosocial, because of how editing works, you hear or watch the same thing over and over again to make sure like it's it's fitted right. So I was listening to Psychosocial so many times that I eventually grew to like it. But I kept telling myself, well, they're satanic. And then I eventually was like, oh, I'll just give the rest of the music a listen. And I listened to all their albums back to back. Self-titled, Iowa, The Subliminal Verses, All Hope is Gone, and uh, Point Five: The Great Chapter. I think I got a little bit into corn at some point. I think I just dabbled in a couple of, of other bands, even like Five Finger Death Punch. I didn't have a tolerance for, for like, I don't want to say good music, but I mean like lower tempo stuff. And eventually, I just had a, had a moment of like, I want to collect CDs. So I went to a CD shop I never went into before. I never went into a CD shop before. The first CD experience I had, I went through and they had, they, they had, um, they had Korn's Life is Peachy, which I think is their best album, in my opinion. They had, uh, Down with a Sickness, Disturbs debut album. They had Kill Switch Engage's Atonement. I think they had Memento Mori, not Memento Mori, Lamb, Lamb of God self-titled. Their first track is Memento Mori. They had Dio's second album. They had Megadeth comp album. And then I also picked up like three very influential albums. I picked up Super Unknown, Soundgarden. I picked up Verses by Pearl Jam. And then I picked up Facelift and the Nothing Safe Collection from Alice in Chains. That's kind of what started it all. Although I didn't become a huge Alice in Chains fan until college. Still liked them a lot out of like all the albums I got. I loved Facelift and, uh, like all the other songs on Nothing Safe. I'm like, wow, these are great. The next time I went into the CD shop, I was the luckiest man in the world. Some guy had traded in all of his Alice in Chain CDs. So I got the rest of the discography. I got Dirt. I got their self-titled. I got Sap. I got Jar Flies. I got Black Gives Way to Blue and Devil Put Dinosaurs here. I was like, wow, I have the whole discography. And I just listened to it and you know that led me to like oh why is the vocalist different and i looked into the death of lane staley and um you know who william duvall is and like there was a lot of songs i like but i was still like in a heavy phase like i still wanted like heavy music which is why like i wasn't as leaning on verses as much as i as much as i do now college was a very dark period of my life to Point Park University in Pittsburgh during the peak of the pandemic. I had no friends. I was very isolated. We, I was lucky enough to like, the, the way things were is that if you were in a dorm for two people, one person would stay in the dorm and the other person would be relocated to a hotel like a couple blocks away. And I don't think I'll ever be in a hotel as long as I wasn't there like for like three months. And that was like, Cool and all, but I mean, super isolating. I still felt extremely ostracized, sort of ogled at, like in a, in a negative light. I felt less than human there. Um, it's where I had my first esports experience that eventually 
led to my disavowment of, of esports in a way. That same day was was the day I won the second place of, of the Newgrounds VA contest. So like immediately after getting that high, I was told to shut the fuck up by the coach. And then he never apologized. And and that was just a, a rough period. At some point between then I did attempt to end my life. So I was hospitalized for ten days. I was extremely sad, mostly because I knew because of those 10 days I was away from school, I would forever be behind in schoolwork. Uh, in fact, when I went back to school, I was told by one of my professors in my graphics design class, he goes, it is in your best interest to drop this class because you miss so much. So from the get-go, I had to drop a class, which was horrible on my ego. Even though I only had like four other classes, I was constantly on the catch-up. And also when I was with the esports team, I would literally sacrifice my time. Immediately after my classes ended, I would go straight to the to the esports office and start working on like setting up scrimmages, doing like any busy work that the coaches didn't want to do. Because it's like esports there was was like my only reason of staying at that point. Because I'm like, I, I already lost to school, right? Like I, I've already lost. It was during that time that I listened to the slower, more depressing songs by Alice in Chains, uh, which is why Frogs and Sludge Factory are probably one of my favorite songs from them, just because of, of the state I was in and how much those songs resonated with me when I was in that, that mental state. I could argue that 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 Slipknot and and uh, System of a Down helped me through some hard times, but but none like Alice in Chains, none 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 compare to to their music, to their lyrics, to to their feelings. So they will always be number one in my heart, even if they release shit music, which they haven't, in my opinion. <laughs> but enough with the the sad bullshit. Because of that. From Alice, I then like steeped into to, like more slower music because I picked up Mad Season, which was a super group of Lane Staley, people from Pearl Jam, and people from I don't want to say Screaming Trees, although we did have Mark Lennigan as a side vocalist on some tracks. But that was a lot slower pace from Alice, and I still liked it. So that got me into like from there I got into Red Vox. From there I got into uh to Pearl Jam a lot easier. From there, I got into Stone Temple Pilots to uh, just just a whole slew of bands that like I wasn't as into before because I'm like, oh, this isn't heavy. Th this this isn't like the hardest thing. Like I got into REM <laughs> b because of Mad Season. I, I have a lot of REM this somehow. Songs and albums that I recommend. <laughs> I say this is difficult because, again, everybody's taste is different. This is a known fact. So, because I recommend it doesn't mean you're, you're guaranteed to like it. One in particular, I definitely want to recommend Bulls on Parade, but the cover by Denzel Curry. I'll, I'll try to limit it to, to one per artist. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 by Class of 99 for the movie The Faculty was another super group. And they only did that one song, I'm pretty sure. But it's uh, Tom Morello and Lane Staley. And I, I for, forgive me, but I don't remember the other artists associated in that band. I think there was a DJ in there, too. Bleeding the Orchid by Smashing Pumpkins. That actually got me into Smashing Pumpkins and buying the Zeitgeist album. That's the only album I have by them and I've like given a full listen to. Uh, I understand that that one isn't like looked on too highly, but I really like it. Here Comes the Hot Stepper by Ini Kamose. I don't even think my, my friends know this all too well. I really like T-Pain. I don't listen to a lot of, of R&B or, or rap artists, but T-Pain I do think stands out a lot. I would say listen to his mashup. It's, it's just called T-Pain Mashup to the beat with Kurt Hugo Schneider. It's, it's very nice. He sings. No autotune. 
It's all sung. It's very beautiful. Another one that's not really a track, but one I really like is uh, Serge Tonkian singing with his father. Serge Tonkian is the vocalist of, of System of a Down. And I believe it's called Bariakari, which is a sort of Armenian folk song. Probably got that pronunciation wrong, but uh, again, highly recommend it. I would say from the album above from Mad Season, they only have one album, sadly. Fuck, they're, they're all good. I, I, okay, I'm going to do two for this one. I would do I'm Above and Long Gone Day, but honestly, the whole album is, is great. Honestly, if it, one of the best live sets is, is their MTV Unplugged. So give, give that a full listen. Also, Screaming Trees is, is not as known, but they were another Seattle alternative band during the grunge era. Give Sweet Ab- Bolivian a listen, uh, that album. If I was to just do one song to recommend, Shadow of the Season, their, their, their first track, that, that one's really good. And because I don't want to drag this out too long, I'm just going to do the rest of, of Stone Temple Pilots. I, I, I really love their, their music as of recent. If you haven't already, Interstate Love Song has just been a brain worm in my head, uh, or earworm. From Tiny Music, songs from the Ma- from the Vatican gift shop, and so I know that that one's really beautiful. From one without uh, Scott Weiland, one that really resonated with me as of recent is called "The Art of Letting Go" from their 2018 self titled album. Hopefully, that's enough recommendations. Although I could I could go all day. Success is a a very broad term, and of course, it varies from person to person. Because it depends on what your goal is in life, whether that's the pursuit of happiness, the evolution of man, or some other means of, of keeping yourself from, <laughs> from ending it all. Just something to, to help you wake up in the morning and give you a goal to say, I have a reason for waking up. I have a reason to continue. Because success is, is sort of the, the, the need for that the mindset necessary for it. I mean, it, it depends on person to person, of course, again. Um, like the grind mindset actually works for some people as patronizingly toxic it is with, with the alpha, beta, sigma male grind set bullshit. Um, if that works for you, if that works for you. I'd say the baseline of success is doing the most you can. And on the outside looking in, that may not seem like a lot, right? Sometimes the best you can do is getting out of bed. Sometimes the best you can do is passing a test. Not doing well on it, passing. Sometimes the best you can do is just not enough for other people. But your container, you as a person is only as full as you are. Everyone's container is different. I, I could run for like an hour and I'll, I'll pass out. Like I'll go, to, I'll go to bed immediately. But other people, I could run all day, right? The container varies from person to person. So, so with that in mind, as for how to succeed, it's hard. It is hard because if if you don't already have in mind or, or have established how you go about the steps to achieving success, it's very hard because it's trial and error. It's like um, learning in school. There's different ways to teach. Like for me, I learn best with hands-on, like actually doing it physically. Some people are really good with flashcards. Some people are really good with, with like just learning from a YouTube video and automatically applying it. It varies from person to person. And sometimes all those don't work for people. So success is the same way. How you go about achieving success depends on how you plan it out. But that's, that's the thing that unites all success is some form of plan. Because you can get lucky. There are people who are lucky and just stumble upon 
the success they're looking for just by pure luck. But there does need to be some some thought that goes into how am I going to to go about this? Because one thing I've I've learned with with my depression is that you can want change to happen and you want shit to get better, but if you don't change anything, you know, it's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different outcome. If you want there to be a positive change or a change at all, there has to be something to change it on your side of it. I, I, I think, I, again, I, I touched on this with... um with uh, <laughs> the, the, the aspects of people I don't like. How you define like how much success there is can also be difficult. Like for me, I struggle with anything less than perfect is unacceptable. But that's on a personal level. If it's other people, I give them a pass all the time. I completely understand they can only have so much energy. They probably have other shit going on in their life. It's no right for me to judge. But when it comes to me, I'm my biggest bully. I remember when I would be doing um, schoolwork, and I'm like, okay, I got X amount of pages done today. I should aim for the same amount tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, and I don't do the same amount. I do less. I kick myself in the ass, and it's even harsher because logically, it's like I did that amount yesterday. Why couldn't I do it today? I still achieved success, but not the success I wanted. I didn't do as much as I wanted, but I still progressed. So you may need to humble yourself. Saying that at least you moved. You didn't stay in the same place. You still progressed. It may not be a lot of progress, but you progressed. The fact that you're moving at all is intrinsically positive. Now, it could go backwards, right? Like, you, you could be worsening yourself, and, and hopefully you realize that and try to adjust. Also, being sedentary, which, you know, is also a main aspect of, of, of Cowboy Bebop, you know, why they're in space is, is like symbolism for, for just sedentariness. You're not in the present. You're not in the future. You're living in the you're living in the past in a sense, because you don't move at all. Nothing happens in space. It's just vast and expansive. So if you decide to do nothing and you're complacent with how things are, then you don't have to change anything. And that can be your success of retaining that. But if you want change, you you have to take initiative. I think this will be the, the most sentimental the dreams I have and how I feel about them. I already talked about dreaming of, of being a voice actor as a kid. Um, and, and to an extent, I still dreams of that, but I don't think to the, to the same extent I did as a kid, because I don't think I strive to be as popular of a voice actor as I once have. I cherish what I already have accomplished whether or not I gain more popular roles or I just continue being the same level as I am now, um, I'm indifferent towards. As for current dreams, I really want to to be a musician. I want to pick up a guitar. I want to become a better vocalist. I remember when I was going to go to the Alice in Chains concert, I, I, I kept manifesting that they would bring me on stage, despite the fact that that would logistically never happen. I do think if, if you're into music, it, it is a dream to, to perform with the artists you look up to, no matter how out of reach the idea is. I dream of, uh, I don't want to say being rich, but being comfortable with, with like where I live having enough to put food on the table, you know, still have enough to, to buy things that I want that aren't necessary every now and then. Most importantly, I dream of 
being happy with my partner more more than anything. We we don't have to live an extravagant life, but it would just be it would mean the world to me to to just live with them and be content with each other. I really love them and they help me through the when I tried in college to uh, to end my life, they were there for that. They helped me through so much shit. I, <laughs> I haven't been the best partner to them either, if I'm being honest, and I'm not proud of it, but I'm working through it. There's one other thing I dream of. I dream of being a better person, more than just being a better partner, a better person. I don't expect to, to change the world. I don't expect to be revolutionary. I don't expect to be remembered in the history books. The most I dream of doing is just making those I love feel happy. All this type of shit out of the way. What are my plans going forward? I'm going to start a job soon, hopefully. I sort of have it lined up. I have all my certifications and uh, and trainings done. I just need to... uh, Get in contact with uh, the firm that I'm going to be working for and uh, start work so I won't have as much free time on my hands. I might stream every now and then. I don't think I'll be speedrunning Clue Finders for a bit because I think um, I'm a little bit tired of it. In case you haven't seen it, which I assume you haven't, I actually was able to run Clue Finders third grade at a, at a live event, and that was that was huge for me. I was I was happy to to be the first person to to ever showcase that game for a, for a speed running event. And that was phenomenal. Otherwise, <laughs> in a way, I kind of want to just focus on, on working, saving up money, um, and, and trying to, to better myself as a person through whatever means I can get my hands on. <laughs> Beyond that, I don't know. I'll probably just do my regular routine of just playing video games, watching YouTube, falling asleep, <laughs> and then just finding work in between there. If anything exciting does happen, I'll just go where the where the flow of the river takes me. I want to elaborate more on the story of when I ran into uh, Vinny Vine Sauce at Too Many Games 2022. I was sort of at a low, and I, I usually get at a low uh, at like the midpoint of conventions because uh, it's just a lot of people, and I don't have a high social battery. Um, I also had a friend with me who was there for the first time, and uh, no offense to him, but I did feel like I was was like babysitting in a sense because I wanted to do my stuff, but I also wanted to make sure he did the stuff he wanted, and. Um, I I just really wasn't happy, and even though um, I took my meds, I was feeling really depressed, which uh, definitely makes me feel vulnerable, because um, as much as I don't want to admit it, I am very dependent on on my uh, depression medication. So when that doesn't work, I do start to feel hopeless in addition to uh, the, the oncoming depression. And as... We were leaving one of the venues. I was wearing a red Vox hoodie. I accidentally bumped into him. He said, oh, nice hoodie. And I said, thanks. And I double t- did a double take. And I was like, wait. And it was it was him. And I accidentally yelled, oh, my God. And then he did like a like a scared jump back because <laughs> he, he was going incognito. And uh, I gave him like a short snippet of, of, of my life story. I told him like how I got into red Vox and. And, and my stints as a voice actor. And in a way, he sort of said, like, good job, but also it almost felt like a, I'm proud of you. Even though the relationship I have to, to him is, is parasocial, having someone you look up to say they're proud of you, someone you find as an inspiration, say they believe in you to succeed, is... A massive boost of of a lot of emotions, but also just hope. That's not something I've had a lot of in my in my history of of living. 
not only am I extremely grateful to to him for what I assume for him was just like a simple, hi, how are you? <laughs> it's important to to count the small things in life because there can be a lot of dark things. There can be a lot of things that choke us, keep us down, and we can ruminate in our own darkness. And it can be very overbearing to, to be lost in that sort of void. And sometimes it's just like getting a candy bar while you're out. Getting a nice drink. Playing a game you've been waiting to play. Because people deserve a a reason to continue to live. People deserve to, to not hate themselves. We're all humans, and I think sometimes we forget that. And we may not be able to, to all stick together, but I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot more people hurting than I think we failed to realize. And we failed to, to comfort. So. Cherish the ones you already have. And love in your life. And if you can. Remember those who have passed on. And continue to inspire.